He's from Spain, he's not Turkish. Onlar için e, koltuk yok. But that doesn't mean I have become a saint or I have transformed myself. I may be just an imitator. And, and for a short time, when there are people here and there is a camera, so I must say the right thing and people will be impressed. That is not being a saint. A saint is walking, talking, doing, but with a whole different attitude. No pretension, no show business. So that's really the whole thing about, but I will go through some of the things. So God tells us these are our, your saints, we make no distinctions, anybody who follows any of the, say, the, uh, the prophets will be saved. Okay. Now, uh, uh, then I will read out something that Rumi said about this, every prophet Every saint has his own spiritual method. Because even, let's say among Muslims, we are all Muslims, but everybody has a different personality, attitude. So like that, there are saints, and every saint, even if they're talking about, even if they belong to the same religious tradition, they have a little different approach, different personality. Not everybody is drawn to the same values or saints. Okay. Sorry? Yeah, everybody is created unique. Even the masters, even the saints are unique. It's a particular approach. Not everybody will be drawn to the same saint. Some will go to one, another will go to another. And why? Because it doesn't click. Your personality and that personality must click. And then, okay, yes, he's my Baba or whatever. I'm not making fun of any Babas. I, I believe in certain Babas also. Um, then Rumi at another place says, God has singled out certain servants so that everyone who seeks him may find him within them. Okay. All the prophets have come for this reason. Only they are the way. Only the prophets are the way. Prophets are the way, and those who have followed the prophets, those who have followed the prophets, in another place, Rumi says, uh, Muhammad, that king of the prophets, said, I am the ship in this universal ocean. He sa Rumi is saying, Muhammad is the ship in the universal ocean. I, or that person, who has become my true vicegerent, like those who have become my true representatives, I or that person can be your guide. 
uh, of course, this applies to Muslims. If you don't follow Muhammad, then you don't follow a Muhammadan saints, right? And this might be true in other religions, have others, their saints, and they may be either the prophets or the saints can be a guide. But in our everyday life, in this age or at any age when the prophets are absent, the representatives, the true representatives of the prophet is the best we can do and they too can guide us. And remember, as far as I can tell, uh, everybody will be judged according to the circumstances God has put that person in or the knowledge that has been given to that person. You know, some Muslims say that, oh, unless uh, a person becomes a Muslim, uh, there's no hope. But I don't see that in the Quran. Unless you are meaning in it in a universal sense. In a universal sense, anybody who surrenders to God, this is in the Quran. But, and they may not have the opportunity to know about the Prophet Muhammad or the Quran. You know, how many Japanese have the opportunity? And especially with what our brothers, some brothers are doing around the world, why would a lot of people really want to know God? You cannot believe in three gods and think, oh, I love God. Sometimes I love this one, sometimes I... No, the focus has to be one. That is a requirement. I mean, when the prophet said God has sent 124,000 prophets or messengers uh, with the same message, and in every language, in the language of the people, the Quran says. The Quran says, uh, to every nation, God has sent a messenger. And with the same message, the message of oneness of God. And in the language of the people. Okay, so not everybody, uh, I mean, the Quran is not the only revelation. The Quran may be the most perfect one, but not the only revelation where God has sent guidance. Anyway, so prophets are the way and saints are those who have followed the prophets or those who are the true representatives of the prophet. Uh, a scholar is not exactly a true representative of a prophet, but you have to internalize the wisdom, internalize the wisdom of the Quran, wisdom of the prophet. You know, when uh, the prophet, peace be upon him, died, Aisha radiallahu anhu uh, was asked how what was his character? You probably heard this. And he said, haven't you read the Quran? She said, haven't you read the Quran? His character was the Quran. Quran, the Quran was his character. So the prophet was somebody who had totally internalized the wisdom contained in the prophet. So for instance, when people say, what's the meaning of la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? The way I say, la ilaha illallah means God is one, truth is one, reality is one, and Muhammad is his messenger in the sense that he is the example of someone who lived with that consciousness all the time. So how do you live with that consciousness of God being one, truth being one, reality being one? It transforms the w your attitude. You see, it's a very important, we sometimes don't see Because when we believe in oneness of God, we know that everything comes So our attitude that to you changes because you and I are from exactly the same source. And you and that plant, exactly the same source. So we have an intimate relationship with not only each other, but for, with the whole universe. With the Hindus and Jews and Christians, because God is one. So this message is not just, uh, oh, if you don't believe in one, you're in trouble. Why? Because that oneness, because, you know, one of the names of Allah is Al-Haq, the truth. The one reality. The reality is one. If you believe that reality is one, the source is one, and that the final destination is also one, and even now it is one. Okay. So we must behave with that awareness that everything I'm looking at is coming from Him. You are a messenger from, in a way, in our limited sense, a messenger from Allah for me. A test also from Allah. How do I behave with you? 
how do I treat you? This is because la ilaha illallah. If I know la ilaha illallah, I will be nice, kind, not arrogant, da 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 But if I forget that and then I think, you know, I know a lot about Rumi, these people don't know, let me teach them, these are ignorant people, you know, <laughs> then I've lost it and I have nothing to teach. Okay. Anyway, you know, back and forth is the same deal. I mean, whether you, ultimately this is the message. There is no other message. And the rest of the time people just say different things to pass time and any other confusion people might have about this particular message. So let me see what I want to say. Uh, There's another big difference between prophets, saints, and ordinary people. Okay, who did I say prophets are? Chosen by God. Who are the saints? Those who have followed the ways of the prophet and really internalized the wisdom. In, in the Islamic tradition, those who have internalized the wisdom of the prophet, wisdom of, of the saints. So this is kind of a baraka passing from, you know, in the silsila, in the tariqat, from one master to another master a wisdom passing from heart to heart that you cannot learn from books. A particular sta state, a particular how, passing from heart to heart okay. that you cannot learn from the books. Okay. Now, uh, there's another thing to understand. We see with our eyes, we have five senses and our rationality, our intellect. But the prophets have one more or maybe, or maybe more than that, uh, uh, faculty of perception. In, in Sufism, we call it eye of the heart, ayan al kal, the, the awakened heart. You know? It can also, Rumi can also refers to it as the intellect, the high intellect. Okay. So uh, he says that the prophets and saints have the intellect and they see way beyond far above ordinary people, the difference is huge. Because too often you have people who say, oh, you know, let's say a saint, a veli. Too often you have people saying, oh, what does he know? He eats like me, you know, he walks like me, he's uh, not any more handsome than I am. He even goes to the toilet like I do, you know. So, yeah, who is he? Big deal. And, and look at him, he's hanging out with the mayor of the city. He's not a real one, he's a fake one. Okay. Now Rumi has several answers to this. Well, occasionally there are fake ones. And maybe there are more fake ones than the right ones. Okay. He's not denying that. But just because somebody is hanging out with the mayor or the prime minister or a famous singer does not mean that that person is nothing okay, or not real. Because there are reasons why uh, that person might want to do that, which we may not uh, be aware. Now, first of all, a saint, uh, forget about prophets, you know, they are way above everybody, but saints, saints have an awakened heart. They can perceive way more than we can. It's not just vision, but perceiving at all levels. Like, I don't know what's in your heart. I don't know whether you are mentally even present. Maybe you're thinking about someone you know uh, back in Maldives. So or in Cairo, who knows, you see. Um, but I'm not able to perceive. I will think, oh, she's listening to me. I, I must be saying something really important and rightly, you know. But who knows? But a saint will be able to tell. And saint might say, by the way, kism, oh, sorry, kism is a Turkish word. Like, my daughter, bring your mind back to this, our present conversation, you know. But I'm not able. I will just look at your eyes, oh, she's nodding and nodding her eyes, nodding her head. I'm doing the right job. <laughs> but who knows? So the saints have perception that goes beyond ordinary people's perception. I don't know what's happening here, right behind me. And there are plenty of arrogant people who think, you know, they are very intelligent. They have a master's and doctorate from Harvard they understand, they don't need the, the religion and namas, these things are for ordinary people, you know. They are like above. And they have read Rumi, they have even 
done some whirling. They don't, they don't need this type of childish stories of Adam and Eve. And, oh, come on, give me a break. I know, I've read Plato. I can quote Aristotle, Descartes, Derrida. You know, I've studied in France. But um, God is saying there, there is a limit there is to what our intellect can do. We, our intellect is very, very limited. We don't know even, uh, you know, let's say in science. In science, in Newton's law of gravitation, says F force, if most of you heard this, M1, the mass, M2 over D square times the constant. This is the force of attraction between. Now, even in the labs, instead of two M1 and M2, if you have the third one, M1, M2, M3, it's very complicated cal calculation, okay? And not possible with the mind. Maybe if you sit down with pen and paper, you're very smart for a long time with the help of a calculator, you might be able to. If it's four pieces, then it's almost impossible. And the more, uh, because the way we calculate two different things, two masses, is by ignoring the existence of other things. But the more, so three, four, five things, it's almost impossible, even at a physical level. Through mathematical level, it's almost impossible. And this world and the universe contains millions and billions and billions of things. We have, our <laughs> rationality is absolutely clueless about how all these things are interrelated. Even mathematically, they cannot. Even at the physical level, they cannot. And beyond physical, there are levels and levels of meanings and realities of things. What do I mean by different levels of reality? You have a body, you have a soul, you have a heart. Most of us have no clue beyond the body level. Even at the body level, we only see the surface. We don't know how the heart is working right now, or the stomach is digesting, the intestines, what the, we don't know. Very limited perception. Okay. Now the saints have cleansed their hearts, and they can perceive almost infinitely beyond. This is what we don't understand. And we have too many arrogant intellectual types who say, ah, come on. What is, I can understand this. There's not much difference. I don't need. But they have something we don't. And Rumi points out, for instance, in the Quran, uh, God says in the Quran that when the Quran is recited, be silent. Otherwise, shut up and listen. You know? There are things that you will not understand. There is something to gain from a revelation that cannot be easily explained to you. So be quiet and listen. But same with the saints, you know, those who have internalized. I'm not saying exactly the same, but uh, when you go to a saint, they have a perception, a depth, that we have no clue about. So, but if we sit in their presence, we might gain something. And listen to them and really try to figure out what, what are they saying. For instance, I'll give an example. I went to see a sheikh in a tariqa in, in Turkey, in Istanbul. Uh, his name was Sefer Efendi. Sefer. Sheikh Sefer Efendi. Efendi is a like, respectable term in Turkey. And on that day, he told a story of the Prophet, which still stays with me. It's a very important story, I think. And that's the only time I saw him. After the, within a year, he passed away. He said one day the Prophet and his Sahabala companions, they were sitting together and uh, this man, a, a terrible person, very sinful person, he has done every bad thing in the world, came and uh, he said, uh, Ya Rasulullah, can I be one of your companions? And some of the companions told the Prophet, you know, he's a terrible guy, you know, I'm not sure this is a good idea etc. Something of this kind. And uh, he said, you know, I am so sinful. If you tell me at least one thing, if you ask me, I will stop that one. I cannot promise too much at once, but tell me one thing uh, that I promise to you, I will not do. The prophet said, okay. He said, all right, so from now on, please never lie to me. <laughs> okay, then you can be my companion. And other people thought, that's, a, that's the easiest one. He's a murderer and he's this and that and that. And, he, and the Prophet said, you know, 
just uh, give him some time. So the next day, he did some horrible things, and he came to the Prophet, and he asked, did you do anything like this? And he promised not to tell a lie. So he said, oh, I'm sorry, yes, I did something like this. Then he realized that, I mean, not telling lies has other consequences. So he cannot do that anymore. Okay. So like this, one by one, he had to give up all his qualities, all other bad qualities, other bad habits, because he promised to tell the truth. Okay. So this telling the truth is a very big deal. You know, being true. If we are true, if we are honest to ourselves, we not only lie to others, we also lie to ourselves. Constantly telling us this, that. But if we really reflect, we'll find out that we are all hypocrites in one, in di at different levels, you know. So when, you know, one of the example, one of the characteristics of the Prophet was that he was a truthful person, sincere, truthfulness. These qualities is what we need to imitate. And we learn it best also from examples of others. Not just, if I tell you all wonderful things and then you find out this man, what a liar he is. He's actually this and that and that. And he told us he teaches at Nesbuddin Erbakan University. And next day you see him uh, working in a shop selling uh, cigarettes or something. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, nobody becomes bad by doing that. But if you discover that I'm a liar, then every nice thing I say this evening, their value will be lessened. Okay. Now, uh, so the, uh, what I really want to say earlier was the intellect or this higher, this eye of the heart, ordinary people do not have and the saints have. And to the extent you polish your heart, you will be able to see. You know, there is a hadith that uh, uh, huh, yeah, I, I forgot the particular one, but I remember this much. That uh, there is a piece in the, in the human body, when that is clean, the whole body is clean. Everything is alright, and that is the heart. But there is also one about the polishing of the heart. Of course, the polishing of the heart, what we mean in Islam is by doing good things and by, by zikr, by remembering Allah. And there is also an interesting uh, you know, aspect about why zikr helps. Because in order to get rid of some, a bad quality, if you think of that quality and say, oh, you know, I'm a liar, I should get rid of lying, I should get rid of lying. Instead of doing that, you're focusing on lie, you see, when you're like thinking, lie, lie, I must not do hypocrisy, I'm a hypocrite, I should not hypocrite. It's better if you, the better way of doing is focusing on what you should be doing. You know, so God's names are the qualities, right? the kind one, the generous one, when you are invoking God by those names, you are actually invoking those qualities within you. Because all those qualities, we are made in the image of God. The image doesn't mean God has two hands and two legs and a face like us, one nose. He cannot breathe from behind, he cannot see from, no. In terms of qualities, Prophet said, God created Adam in his own image. That means all the qualities of God are inherent within us. And actually, it would be cool if we, were, if we were not also given the quality of freedom. God is the real independent one, and we also have a little piece of that, freedom. And that is why we can become the worst of the worst or the best of the best. We can be like angels, and we can be like the most horrible creature on earth. This, if we didn't have the freedom, we'd be very obedient Muslims. Because we have freedom, and all the bad qualities, our shaitan, if you say, uh, are pulling us this way, that way, that way, and we're like, ah, ah, yes, yes, yes. And then we are forgetting. But because we have the freedom to be able to, to be drawn to different things, or have the will to defy, that's where we get lost. And all the rules, regulations, guidance are there to guide our intellect, our reason on the right track. Otherwise, there would be no need. If, if freedom 
the quality of freedom wasn't there, would already be guided. Because of the freedom, a tree doesn't need any guidance. Tree is doing its job that Allah gave the tree to do. But because we have the freedom made in the image of God, we forget that we are created because we, have, we can feel like we have a will and we have the freedom. And that's where we get lost. We have the freedom within, within the dimension that God has given us. Do everything within this scope. Do not go beyond certain limits. That's the meaning of Sharia. Sharia kind of keeps us more or less safe. Okay, if you cross that, then we are falling in a dangerous uh, situation. You know, for instance, the tariqa is not for everybody. Rumi says that Sharia leads to tariqa, and tariqa leads to hakika. Hakika means the truth. The three levels, Sharia, tariqa, hakika. He says Sharia is like the candle the do's and don'ts of God. If you do those, if you follow those, you are more or less a healthy person, psychologically. Okay. It's like, as a human being, if you don't take a bath every few days or every day in the summertime, <laughs> and if you don't eat every now and then, you can't uh, sit and talk and wonder and do your humanly things. So Sharia, and that's for the body. Of course, it has an effect mentally also, but the, the Sharia is, uh, is in, in particular, I think, for the psyche. To remain more or less healthy, we need to, God is saying, pray, fast, don't tell lie, don't steal, do according to this rule, that rule. It's not like God is benefiting from us. It's keeping us more or less healthy. And then Tariqa is also, Sharia means the road leading to salvation. Road, the road leading to water actually, water of salvation. Okay. Tariqa also means road, but it's a more custom designed, you know. You have a guide and the guide tells you do namaz this way or that way. Uh, don't think about this, don't think about that. Uh, recite this surah or that surah, or, uh, fast on this day or that day, beyond the Sharia. You should practice, continue with the Sharia, but do it with a deeper understanding. That's your tariqa. And if you put your heart and soul in the tariqa, God, in His kindness, might reveal the truth finally. It leads to hakika, the truth, tasting of the truth. And if you continue to do that, inshallah, that, that experience can be lasting, not just occasionally you have a vision and sometimes it lasts, and then you kind of become like a sheikh, a, a great veli or something. But this uh, sharia is important on the way. And who gives us the sharia? The prophets give us the sharia. Rumi did not create sharia. Rumi was a follower of sharia. You know. And by the way, this whirling dance, this is not essential to Sufism, of course. You should know that. This is peripheral. And nobody should try to do that at home without serious practice. <laughs> or just do it when you are near hospitals. <laughs> because you might need a doctor's help when you faint. <laughs> okay. um, so after this, you know, uh, you are going to go for the sem SEMA. Actually, I had some things to say about SEMA. Can you tell something? Yeah. Maybe I could, you know. So uh, I'm telling them about the Yeah. Shams and Mevlana meet. Right. So Mevlana is in the horses and Shams is holding the horse and he's asking the Mevlana question. Prophet Muhammad is bigger or Bayezid Bayezid this time. Right. So for, for him it was the most difficult question for him but he couldn't answer Mevlana. So what is the Shams belief about this? Well you know this story is told uh, in different ways by different people. But I think it's more or less probably something like this happened. One version that I heard is that, of course, it was a stunning question. Yes. I mean, how could you even question, ever question who is superior? Of course, the prophet is superior. But uh, nobody had asked a question like this. So he was stunned. And the story goes that he fell from his horse. When he came to, came to his senses, he had a realization of what the answer should be. Uh, 
And he, the answer he gave, and this is the version I heard, the answer he gave was that the prophet's capacity was so big that, and his humility was so great that he never thought that he got everything. So no matter how, God, how much knowledge God poured into him, he said, oh God, show me things as they really are. Give me more knowledge. Rabbi jidni ilman. Give me more knowledge. Give me more knowledge. Okay. But Bayezid Bustami, he was a great veli, but his capacity was not quite equal to the capacity of the prophet. And he also was blessed by God, but he thought maybe he has gotten, you know, everything from God, you know. So he may have said, Subhani, glory be to me. <laughs> Under me there is nothing but God. But the Prophet was always so humble, his capacity was so infinite, that no matter what he got, he knew Allahu Akbar, Allah is always greater than... And this is a wonderful thing in Islam. Allahu Akbar doesn't mean call it God is great. This is a wrong translation. It's, it means more God is greater or greatest. Of course God is great. This is, doesn't say anything. It's like saying, God is great and this is bad. <laughs> okay. There's not much difference. <laughs> you know? This is also great. But God is greater than anything you can conceive. Or you can say God is the greatest. So God is the greatest beyond anything you can conceive. If you think you understand God, then you haven't understood. The moment you think you got it, means uh, you didn't quite get it. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, yeah in a way. Is real that he, he wants forgiveness 70 times a day? Who? The go yeah, 70 times a day. Yeah. 70 times a day he asks for God's forgiveness. Or maybe seven, but it doesn't matter. Uh, seven or 70, the de same deal, okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if there is any imperfection. But, you know, by saying that, he's humbling himself, making his capacity greater. Uh, many of us cannot learn because we think we know it all. Uh, you know, I taught Rumi many times, I talked about him. What do you know? You think you know better than me? Please don't. I, uh, I, uh, I'm a professor. You know. I mean, unless you're humble, you're not going to learn. But this is what I know about that story. And it's not that before Shams, Rumi didn't know anything. That's not true. He was already a... a, a a uh, mature Sufi. You know, it's like uh, Shams came, it was like this, uh, you know, something almost like in a boiling point, mm -hmm. and Shams was the one who came and and a little needle, <laughs> and everything kind of, it's like this milk boiling out, you know, a little more heat and but he was already very mature. Otherwise, you would not be able to uh, give an answer like that. I am giving the answer because I already read the answer. <laughs> if you suddenly asked me and I never heard of the story, I would say, mam, mam, mam. <laughs> <laughs>